It's a rainy morning in Los Angeles, and it is Good Friday. It's it's very hard to 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 put to tell the whole story in in a short segment. This channel is not to spoon feed anyone, but rather to to increase more interest in reading for ourselves. What it all means. It is also to to get you to have more questions. If you have questions after. Listening to it. good. See, our faith should not be secondhand. While we listen to sermons and teachings and stuff, we still need to investigate ourselves for ourselves what it all means. You know, the question is always asked about the cross. You know, the because the Bible says a shame shame is that person who is hung on a tree. That means the cross is a shameful thing. It is a shameful thing, but in God's hand. A shameful earthly act becomes the glory of his, the magnificence of his, his plan for salvation for the whole world. It's been intended right from the start. It's not an afterthought that we Gentiles should be, through our Lord Jesus Christ, be grafted into the family of Abraham and become, therefore become heirs of that promise to Abraham and his seed forever. And in the crucifixion and resurrection, that's what happens. So many religions, especially Islam, will just say there's no resurrection. There's no crucifixion, mostly. If there's no crucifixion, then there's no resurrection. You don't need to explain the resurrection. That's why Isa didn't die. You know, it's shameful. How can your God die? How can God? But it is the magnificence and wisdom of our, and power of our God. It, it demonstrates his magnificent love for you and I. It will be so easy for him to just destroy all of us and start over. But no. The love is there. The everlasting love. So that when we accept and become Christians, when we become baptized, Paul in Romans said, we identify with the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and we crucify our selfish and earthly and worldly person on the cross with him so that the life we live now, we live in the spirit of his resurrection. And that's what it all means. So it is powerful. It is magnificent love there's no greater love than this jesus said you didn't kill me i lay my life down i didn't stay dead i rose after three days that's that's the whole gospel why out of love for mankind for you and i and even as we remember the good friday <laughs> alone <laughs> no church service this is strange times we do not understand it but we do not need to understand it every day on my knees i carry that memory of his love for me in the cross that because of that i have hope that i i'm you know death being the last enemy he's conquered it and we are no longer afraid of death the life we live now we live in the spirit of god to do continue the work our Lord Jesus started when he walked this earth. That's what we are to do. On the cross, he said, it is finished. He's done everything he can for you and I. And going forward, we are to continue that, that work which he did while he was walking on this earth. Never forget that. That's the reason for our existence, really. And that is the message of the cross. And there's so many things that came out of that crucifixion where he said to the brigand next to him, the, the guy next to him who was crucified, there are two people crucified alongside with him. He said, today you are with me in paradise. That is, so even as we walk through this earth, we should be fearful because Paul said, if I, I, I long to die to be with Christ, 
but there's work to be done here. So regardless whether I live or die, we live to the glory of God. We live at his will, really. And even as he was being tried, and even as they finally crucified him with the sign above his head, King of the Jews, in three languages, the, the Jewish authority said, don't write King of the Jews, just say, he claimed to be king of the Jews, but Pilate said, I've written, I've written. I'm not going to change anything. He is our king, not just of the Jews, because Paul said there's no, no Jew or Greek, male or female, free or slave. All are equal in the eyes of God. Jesus broke down the barriers of so many things. And that being king... He is now, he has established the kingdom of God on earth and we are living it and we are to demonstrate it as kingdom people. There is work to be done going forward that the, you know, always remember the shame of the cross is the glory of God, the power of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. The world thinks in worldly terms, but it is God's world. And we, you know, the question, another question often asked is, I'm a new Christian. Which part of the Bible should I start? I would say, some say New Testament, some say, but I always say New Te uh, Old Testament. If you must do old and new together, you know, one, start from a Genesis to Revelation. Yeah, you know, it's whole story. You cannot take one part, oh, we're Christians now, forget about the old. Our roots really is in the Old Testament. And yeah, I liked the example of Dr. Hugh Ross. When he was a young person, he asked his parents, he looked at the stars, are the stars hot? His mother said, go to the library. <laughs> so he went to the library and read every book he can on astronomy and became interested in, in astronomy and later became an astrophysicist. But Looking at astronomy and looking at the galaxies is one thing. He began to ask, how did that happen? Who made this? So he decided to read every religious book. He said the older books would have answers, right? Surely, whether it's the Quran, the Bible, the Buddhist literature, the Hindu Vedas or whatever. He read everything, but there were consistencies and inconsistencies and incompleteness in all of them, except when you pick up the Bible, he said, I will read it until I find inconsistencies, but he never did. He took 18 months to read the Bible. And we should do too. And stories are told of John Muir and other other Scottish people. You know, in the old days, there's no, no entertainment. So their mothers usually made them read the Bible after school. There's nothing to read. There's no library. The villages are so poor. The only thing you have is a Bible. So, you know, many authors, many you know, famous people said, my mother made me read the Bible from beginning to end and again, beginning to end. <laughs> That's your their entertainment. And it made them what they were. You know, John Ruskin said that. He became an artist and a writer. John Muir said that. And I think Alexander McLaren too. Alexander McLaren wrote commentaries on everything, sermons and commentaries. So really to be an educated person, not just religious person, you need to read the Bible. Because when you look out at creation, how did it all begin? What comes first? The, the created order is in here, throughout. It's not just in Genesis. So, like I said, this, <laughs> this little posting should create more questions and curiosity in you and everyone, just as it did mine. This is to satisfy my own curiosity too. I listen and I want to check it out for myself. I never let anybody say anything to me which I don't check out and think for myself. Does it really say that? Or they have an ulterior motive, an agenda. Never, never do I let anyone define anything for me. 
and it's been many decades. And I hope that for you too, that you would today or any day, pick up the Bible, read Old and New Testament together. Read Old and New, yeah, read Old, read New. It's, it's fascinating. And, you know, find the answers for yourself and grow in your Christian faith. It is, it is an incredible thing to, to be strong in the Christian faith and to tell God, you said so here. I hold you responsible to it. I claim that promise for me and my family. Put him to the test, God said. Put me to the test and see if I will not open up a window in heaven and pour out a blessing on you that you have no room for it. Won't you like that to be real in your life? I know I do for my life. 